Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for thanks for coming on to to talk with me. And that's really that's really all we're gonna do. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for reaching out. Yeah, and, for sure. And having us on. Um. So. Just, I haven't talked to you, Chris, in such a long time. So yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> how long has it been since you've lived at James's apartment? Um, Dude, that was so long ago. I think like six, seven years. I think. Wow. I think. Yeah. Five or six. I mean, it yeah. had to be at least. Yeah, at least five. At least five years, definitely. And I think that's around the time when you were like really. I don't remember how mu how much equipment you had at that point or what you were doing with this, but you you were kind of at least getting your feet wet. Yeah, I didn't have I didn't have a ton of equipment, um, just like some a controller, you know, to DJ with, um, and then I had I don't even know if I had my my like live gear that I used for like weddings and stuff like that. I'm not even sure how much of that I did. Yeah, or the uh, the equipment to record us and everything and making instrumentals and stuff. Like you have a completely new setup now. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. So that was kind of just the, the the beginning of it when I was starting to starting to learn how to DJ and like figure things out. So are you still doing weddings? <clears throat> uh, yeah. Yeah. They're kind of like my main source of income right now. Um, I do. Usually I get booked for about 20 to 25 weddings a year. That's so cool. I love that. Like doing something that you love like that and then be able to make money off of it. It's just fantastic. So a question I have for both of you guys is going to be, how did you get into it? How did you get into whether, or, cause I'm assuming that you might play another instrument if or be, like, because you have this musical sense that you have this, this creation creativity in your head, you probably would play another instrument. So, right. Well, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll start uh, with me. I, Learned how to play guitar when I was 16. That was like the first um, kind of like musical instrument I learned to play. And just kind of like my what, first what thing kind of guitar? Really what what was your first guitar? Um, it's actually the one hanging up here. It's uh, acoustic Ibanez. Oh, uh, that's a Ibanez are great guitars. Yeah, I love Ibanez I, guitars. I, I hated on them for a long time, <laughs> but then I actually played them and I'm like, all right, they're, they're, they're all right. Yeah, I didn't even buy it. Um, my mom bought it. And she was like trying to learn and she kind of like just gave it up after a few months. And I was like, oh, well, maybe I want to like try it out and, and learn how to play. Right. And then I did. And I, yeah, I've just that's just been the only acoustic guitar I've ever had. I ended up buying an electric one a couple years later. Um, but where, yeah. Where is that guitar? Uh, it's at my brother's studio, yeah, actually. That's right. That's right. Which is also a good segue that my older brother is a musician and he, you know, really got me into music and i probably okay. wouldn't really Fam be doing anything that i'm doing now if it wasn't for him right family business i could i could second that i absolutely know <clears throat> i i owe unfortunately everything to my brother when it comes to my <laughs> musical talent because you know he, he they give you that spark and show you how fun it can be so that's that's really awesome yeah definitely when you have um older siblings too you know they you can like get really um, inspired by them or, you know, they just, my brothers like showed me a lot of stuff that they were into and they're like, uh, my middle brother is nine years older than me and my oldest brother is 13 years older than me. So it's crazy. Dude. There's definitely, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a bit of an age gap there. So, you know, they like would always show me the music that they were listening to or like movies that they like, you know, wow, so like, that's great yeah <laughs> my my older brother he picked the hell he picked on me a lot i mean it's like a tough love thing but it was uh i mean it sounds like a great musical relationship so uh you're like 16 years old you're playing guitar are you playing with your are you playing with your brother um a little bit yeah like he he taught me just like the real real basics and then i just kind of like picked up more of it on my own from there um, and then, yeah, I just, I, I started playing guitar and then once I got like sort of okay at that, I started like writing songs, um, just like acoustic songs that, you know, I'll write lyrics and just like come up with chords and, and, um, patterns just on the guitar. Um, and for a while I thought that I was just going to do like singer songwriter type stuff. 
Um, but that didn't last very long. And I was also really bad at singing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of gave up on that. And then when I was in my early 20s, I think like 2021 was when I started to learn how to DJ. Um, and I was always I was always interested in electronic music. Um, Cause like I said, my, my older brothers like showed me some of the early stuff like chemical brothers and, and underworld. Um, like some of those groups that were popular in the two thousands. No Aphex twin. Aphex twin. Window liquor. Yeah. Aphex twin is definitely <laughs> one of them one too. Of them what is it? Ke chemical brothers. Chemical brothers. Yeah. They're like one of the, I mean, I, I guess you could say pioneers of electronic music. They were just like a, a group that got pretty popular right like before the whole edm explosion thing yeah they, I, mean, they, I think they started making music in the 90s like late 90s right um okay so you're feeling it you're you see you see what you could do you enjoy it <clears throat> and then you start you see a place to make money doing that that's what you're doing now so not only are you doing weddings, I see you do, I saw like some sort of drive-in show that you had. Yeah, that was or, actually, a, that was a live stream. Well, or regardless, like, yeah. or how was it? Like, it seemed like there was a bunch of people on there. I mean, it's, I mean, it's great. It's, it's so satisfying to see pe people just like follow through with what they're freaking good at. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I mean, the last year, I haven't really played any like in-person shows just because of, of COVID and the pandemic. Yeah. But... It's, it's a... <laughs> it sucks. I think yeah. I, I don't know. I look at it completely different. I see COVID as an opportunity to, I don't know, take, take the, the power or not even not take the power, but like transition how we enter us as entertainers entertain people. It doesn't have to be at that fucking bar. And <laughs> Right. I'm yeah. trying not to curse, but like that's the point yeah. of the thing. Like it doesn't have to be at the the bar, the dive bar that you're used to. Like the game has changed so like so immensely. Um yeah. so you're yeah. playing. I seen you post about uh asking your your followers about if you should stream. And like I've just wanted to shout from the rooftops like, yeah, you should fucking stream every day because I mean <clears> like your shit's good. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking you up to make your head big, but it's like no one else is doing this. Like, I, we're taking advantage of it. Yeah. No, I mean, um, yeah, that's kind of like, you know, I don't want to, I don't know if I really want to say upside of, of the pandemic because, I mean, obviously it's a terrible thing and a lot of people have been getting sick and dying. But, you know, even like as a, as a musician, like you can kind of look at it as, oh man, like there's, there's no concerts, no shows like this is this is terrible. This sucks. And like, that's definitely true. But you can still do other things to, you know, take advantage of like a situation and kind of turn right. it into a positive thing. And right. that's why, you know, I, I didn't do any streaming or anything before last year. You know, I, I had no idea like about Twitch or or live right. streaming or any of that. Yeah, um, there's so much available. Yeah. To get yourself out there. But uh, even though things are different now and it is like a bunch of opportunities for artists to find new ways to entertain people. And like you said, it doesn't have to be at the bar. It doesn't have to be at the, the venue you play all the time, but you, you gotta, you gotta think about just like playing in front of people and having those people cheer you on is completely different than doing it on a computer and having people type comments. Yes, it's, it's you're right. You're very right. Every artist <laughs> craves. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, it's there's... just this feeling of like empowerment. Like you can take on the world. It's almost like a drug and you're not going to get that from a live stream, you know? Yeah. The adrenaline. Eh, well, uh, <laughs> I bet you there'd be some people that would debate that, but you're, I, I really agree with you. There's something about that live experience that yeah. you can't, you don't get from this. Yeah. And something yeah. that I've learned in podcasting is there's so much work in post production, pre and post production production. Like I thought it, everything just fell together in one bloop. <laughs> All the conversations were just cohesive and everything just jived and that was it. And it, they threw it together and edited it and it was like done in an hour. Like no freaking way. Like <laughs> like and that's what I enjoy about it. Like I could take my time, I could 
figure out who I want to bring on. I can figure out what we want to do. And then you record it and then we're going to chop it all together and then put it in a nice platter for everybody. We're going to put some little short clips on YouTube that makes somebody laugh and then put the whole podcast on Spotify, which is, uh, you know, really <laughs> Spotify is like a pain in the ass, but like the gift of God at the same time. Cause <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel the same way. <laughs> it's finicky, but it, everyone has it. It's like, you know, the, uh, uh, Excalibur sword in the stone. Everyone's trying to pull out. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, I think it's cool that you could put podcasts on Spotify. I even know some DJs who can, they'll put like a DJ mix on Spotify, but like they have to upload it as a podcast. Um, I haven't looked into that hmm. for myself and I might at some point, but yeah, I know Ooh. you can, you can even put like a DJ mix, like even if Wait. it's songs that you don't own, like sampled that, not song, your songs. like your sampled songs, like your, your beats. Is that what you call them? Yeah. Or like even other people's beats. Like you like, like I could make a DJ mix of all other people's songs and put it up on Spotify as a podcast. It's a weird loophole. Yeah, it's it's oh. definitely a loophole. Like, there's you know, I don't well, know how mean, like legal that is, but I mean, if well, I just did like yeah, some, I've seen people do it too, though. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Distro Kid? Yep. Yeah. So I'm. I think like new companies like that are kind of uh, blurring those lines of copyright. Not not necessarily blurring those lines, but they're they're making sure everybody gets a piece of that that yeah, royalty. Distro Kid. Uh, they actually let you upload cover songs. Yeah, like you can, I know. You can record a cover song of another artist and put it up. There. I, so I sure didn't believe it. With the same thing. Did not believe it. I recorded a very crappy version of a Dustin uh, Kencher. I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, lead singer of Thrice. He he has a solo project. Where he plays a bunch of great acoustic stuff. Yeah. And I did covered one of his songs. I'm like, there's no way this is gonna let me upload this yeah, acoustic you just cover. Check a box. <laughs> <laughs> I paid 20 bucks and I put it up there and now I'm able to just like churn out covers. Yeah. So it's like, it changes the game. Yeah. Like I, yeah, that but, wasn't a thing like years ago, you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Right. Cause before you would have to like get permission from the original artist to like, yeah. you know, make a cover or, or you make any money off of it at least. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now you okay. can just do it right. So the we've severely digressed. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay. So I'm going to, we'll call, uh, Chris, you, you're, you're still kicking ass. You're, you're a pioneer in the new, uh, settlement. Uh, at w where does Spencer fall? Where did Spencer come from? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I basically got all my music taste as a kid from my dad. My, my mom listened to stuff I didn't like. My brother listened to stuff I didn't like. So I basically would just borrow my dad's CDs with a CD player whenever I would like go for a walk or like mow the lawn, listen to stuff like Metallica, Slipknot, Disturbed, Rob Zombie. So uh, in my high school, they uh, had like a guitar class in freshman year. And uh, I had never touched a guitar before in my life. But everything that they had us learn, like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and Ba Ba Black Sheep, I learned it in like five minutes. So like the rest of those class periods, I would just look up guitar tabs and play songs and i passed that class with an a and learned like a whole bunch of stuff so then i went to go try to start a band none of the bands i started worked out they all ended up horrible is um, it because you wanted to play twinkle twinkle little star the whole time <laughs> no um we were trying to do like heavy like metalcore stuff like uh hell yeah like bands i'm like all Aspen about that Alexandria and stuff like that it yeah just, the the people yeah. that got together for said bands it never really quite worked out yeah it's tough it's really tough uh so then my dad was in the military so we moved all over the place and i finally moved here to pittsburgh got a job at uh giant eagle me and chris met each other there and uh he was the one day we were hanging out he was just showing me a bunch of like different instrumentals and stuff that he had worked on like tracks that he was working on and we just for some reason came up with the idea to just come up with a rap song because he had this one rap instrumental Mm -hmm. so i wrote lyrics we recorded it and uh it worked yeah we've been putting out a lot of music since then <laughs> yep we've been doing Wait, stuff so since like, was this in high school did i hear that correctly uh the rap yeah. stuff came after i was just graduated out of high school okay. whenever i moved here me and chris worked on stuff for a little bit i want to say it was 2013 that we first started putting out the rap stuff and then it was like a monthly song pretty much from then until 2016 and then we kind of okay, took a cool. hiatus but we're back at it again. Awesome.
Yeah, so we, right. we met through the Murraysville Giant Eagle. The big bird. <laughs> not a sponsor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Although they do have low prices. <laughs> Fantech. Fantastically low prices. <laughs> but yeah, uh, music's always been an important part of my life. Uh, I, I wanted to be a filmmaker when I was a kid more, but that kind of left me as I got older and I realized what I was good at, which was, you know, writing lyrics and working with the instrumentals that Chris comes up with and doing that whole thing. So, so how do you guys define yourself as an artist? Because I, I, I hate saying electronic dance music. It just sounds like I'm a idiot. <laughs> yeah. It just sounds stupid. Well, um, for myself and my music, I classify as a house music artist. Um, so house, house is music. just like a, a, a subgenre of dance music. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, mostly classified by like four on the floor beats. Um, it's usually like 120 to 130 BPM range somewhere around there and then i make weird horror movie rap music so <laughs> yeah tell tell me more about this uh, th <laughs> uh, that's all i know <laughs> um you ever listen to the misfits you know how they, they do songs like about horror movies and stuff like that yeah yeah all right well just that but rap <laughs> it's almost like not even rap because it just it, it's like a rap style of vocals and like yeah it is like hip-hop but like it has like almost this completely different sound and it's kind of like a struggle trying to find out like where I'm supposed to market it to. Like, do I market it to people who like rap music? Do I market it to people who like horror movies? So I'm still kind of like feeling the grooves out of that and trying to figure out the, the mm -hmm. nicheness of the audience. Yeah. It's right. kind of like basically taking your love for horror movies and, and music and kind of combine, yeah. combining them into one. Cause I've always loved horror ever since I was a kid. I was like 10 years old watching Freddy vs. Jason in the theater. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I think you should be hitting the horror people because those people love that shit. Yeah, that's kind of love what it. I was leaning to. The, uh, the the rap crowds that I've tried to market it to, I, I just I feel like I don't yeah. fit in with them at all. Mm, yeah, well, who cares? <laughs> I mean. Yeah, that's kind of like the, the struggle for any um, music artist is like finding your niche and like, you know, finding the the audience to market it to right. the right artists to surround yourself with. Yeah. Cause like, I feel like if you, you, if you can do that, anyone can be successful. Yeah. It's just a matter of putting the music in front of the right people. Cause like, you know, obviously not everyone's going to like the same, like yeah. not everyone is going to like the same kind of music. You, you show know? one song right. to 10 people. Some of them like it. Some of them don't, some of them just don't care. Everybody's got a different opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I mean. You guys got, you, you found your, your, what you like. Yeah, you just gotta apply it. Keep yeah, keep chugging. Yeah. True. Mm -hmm. Just keep on chugging along. <laughs> yep, that's all you can do. Um, have you ever been profiled? Profiled? As like um, yeah, as a, a like oh, look at this freaking just DJ just being a <laughs> DJ. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know because like or like. Like oh you're you're a D, you're a house DJ like okay just why don't you go eat some ecstasy and shut the fuck up I or, get that or, all the time <laughs> like oh that's not it's even like, that's oh he's a rapper like that's like the first thing that anybody when they find out I make rap music it's just immediate judgment unless you like that kind of music right yeah yeah no I've 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 had people like literally tell me like oh well you're a DJ so you probably like drugs right <laughs> like, um, yeah just blanket statements blanket I mean, <laughs> stereotypical statements well you're a DJ so um but I yeah drugs <laughs> yeah that, that's definitely happened <laughs> yeah so last question for this segment um five year plan for Chris Mays and Spencer um so yeah i have some goal like record labels that i want to release music on um there's like just some a certain ones that are kind of like i guess at the top echelon of house music labels and they're the ones that will really you know take your career to like the next level and and put your music in front of like a larger audience um so yeah i have some goal record labels that i'd like to sign to um and then just like if I could, I'd like to just get booked outside of Pittsburgh too, and you know start playing some shows in some other cities. 
Um, right. but I guess that that would be my five year goal for my music. You take it, Spencer. Uh, yeah. Don't really have a five year plan, <laughs> but basically, well, like, where do you want to go with this? I'm trying to do monthly releases this year. Trying to just you know drop a song every month. Try to keep like the hype train rolling. That way, you know, it's not inundating people with too much, but it's also not like not putting out enough that people forget about it. Right. And then just hopefully building up a fan base enough to the point where next year I can like hunker down and work on an album and actually try to promote that with like music videos and like actually go like all the way with it. But cool. No, I think that's an excellent, excellent strategy because that's what I'm doing. I'm just, I, someone once told me that they, they got, they got a job and they worked for somebody and then worked their way up the company. And then they said to themselves, I wish I would have told myself to start my own company and then work for myself up to that point. Yeah. Like, there's nothing wrong with reaching out to those labels, which will propel you to the exceptional levels of, of notoriety and people are, are not fame, but they more platforms, more views on your music. Mm-hmm. Yes, they will. Nothing wrong with doing that. But I told myself I'm building my empire, not somebody else's. Yeah. But I, I'm not going to refuse help. <laughs> you know for, right. from people uh so like i'm sh- i know that you guys both are very talented and you have what it takes to you know reach and meet those goals so it's really exciting thanks dude yeah yeah it's definitely important to to build your own thing i think but like you'll you'll have to work a lot harder and you'll you know you have to put like a lot more effort in but you know if you're consistent with it and you're passionate about it like it'll pay off in the long run no one Absolutely. ever made it by not working hard. Yep. Yep.